I am pleased and honored to welcome Bob London to today's webinar series, where Bob is going to cover with us how to have strategic discussions with your customers. Um, so those of you, anybody working with customers, whether you are in customer success, sales, any role at all, um, this is a critical skill that you need to hone in on, and there is nobody better to cover this topic than Bob. So Bob, thank you for joining us today. We're thrilled to have you. Thank you very much. I'm blushing over here. All right, well, without further ado, I'm gonna stop talking. I'm gonna shut my camera off. I'm gonna pass it over to my friend, Bob. So again, guys, please make sure you're dropping your questions into the Q&A or into the chat, and we'll be sure to get to as many as we can at the end of our session. Fantastic. So I am going to do a little screen share here and uh, someone will yell if, if it's not working. Um, thank you, Christy. Thank you so much. You are uh, as as I've heard from others, a, an, a force of nature. And congratulations on getting over a thousand registrations for this event, which was astounding. And I, my, my understanding is from your CEO, Dave Blake, that you that that entitles you to a twenty five thousand dollar bonus. So congratulate you. Oh, congratulations so for getting the same thing, Bob. That's fantastic. Thank yeah, you. I bet you didn't even know that. Or, in fact, I bet Dave didn't know that either. So I really appreciate everyone being here. <clears throat> And uh, as we were discussing online, I know that you know that this webinar isn't free. Um, your time isn't cheap, and I want to be respectful of that. So this is this is 60 minutes. This the cost of this is 60 minutes of your time. Hopefully, you'll be on for the whole time. So I don't know how much that's anywhere from 70 to a couple hundred bucks or more. Um, so I, I am a marketing guy by trade and have been. Um, but I don't want to scare you when I say that, um, because marketers, and I'm allowed to say this because I'm a marketer, they have a little bit of a reputation for uh, talking more than they listen. So why, why am I here to talk about listening to customers? Um, I, I'll explain that in a minute. Um, I'm not going to spend, unlike some people, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on me and why you should be here, because you're already here. You made the investment, so thank you. But there's one thing I want to share that seems to have become uh, my calling card. And that is, as you'll see here, I've actually done over um, the last seven years in my marketing strategy practice and now with customer, with customer success and account management and sales training, um, 2,400 <laughs> customer discovery calls. I have two more later today and I have two tomorrow and one Friday. And it's something that it turns out that I love and it's super important. And so, and, and it's been a huge, I just want to say one more thing. It's been a huge development for me professionally and personally, uh, as of less than a year ago, some really generous, wise people in the customer success world said to me, Hey, you're doing all this work on customer discovery and, and, and it's great, but you know, you should consider introducing it to the customer success world. And by golly, they were right. Um, the customer success world is unbelievably generous and, and uh, just really helped kind of bring me along in a very wonderful way. So I think we're probably less than, maybe that's a minute or a minute and a half. So that's not bad compared to a lot of presentations where you tune in in 20 minutes and the person's still talking about their childhood and showing pictures of their family. So I hope you're ready to dive right in because I'm going to give you an example of this thing called radically authentic discovery. Here we go. So let me ask you, if a competitor contacted you tomorrow, um, on a scale one to 10, would you ignore them, the one, or would you immediately get back to them and learn more? Let's call that a 10. What number would you give? So that's, that's a customer discovery question that I use. So I'm going to let it sink in for a second because you may be thinking, yep, he's a marketing guy, right? He's just putting some eye candy up there. It's clickbait. He's just trying to get our attention. You don't ask customers these questions. Do you really? We don't mention competition. Why would we mention competition to our customers? That's a Pandora's box. Why would we give them any oxygen? Well, my question is, having spoken to 2,400 decision makers on the other side of the imaginary vendor customer wall, my question is, do you think you have competitors, you guys on this call? Do you think your competitors ever contact your customers? Oh my gosh. Do you think they, they send them content or drip campaigns or they invite them to webinars? Of course they do. So why do we as vendors, and I consider myself more on the vendor side than the buy side of things, 
Why don't we act like we should never talk about competition? It doesn't exist. Let's get real. Let's, let's get to the truth. And this question is the reason I have it sort of batting lead off here is because it's one of the most disruptive questions, disruptive to the customer's thought process. You're interrupting their normal uh, expectations of like jargony questions and very straightforward questions, questions about your product. Here we are um, in a good way, disrupting them. And this question, the other reason I have it as the lead off is it, re it reveals a ton of useful insights. So the beauty of it is, because some people will say, why would you ask about competition? And the, the amazing thing is, it's not about competition. This question is to get them, like everything else I do, to open up about their relationship and their perceptions of your product or brand. What do I mean? So let's say you ask the question, you got a call from a competitor tomorrow, would you ignore them or want to learn more? One to 10. 10 is you would uh, get back to them. One, you would delete. Um, you'd get back to them quickly if it was a 10. Suppose they say nine or 10, right? You're not going to sit there and say, oh, which competitor? That's, that's not relevant. It's a conversation. You know, these are all live conversations, not a survey. So you have the opportunity if they say nine or 10 to say, you know what? I really appreciate you being so candid. And, you know, that's why we're doing this. We want to know the truth. Um, that's why we ask these types of questions. So why did you say nine or 10? And it's not necessarily what you think. Most of the time, they will say something like this. Uh, so Bob, uh, literally, the reason I would get back to that competitor is because part of my job description, if you want to know, my job description partly says, keep track of best practices in the industry, understand what other competitors are doing, uh, make sure we're getting the right prices, et cetera. So they want to keep they want to keep an eye, their job is to keep an eye on what, what are other ways to accomplish what they're trying to accomplish. And they'll say like, it doesn't mean we're actively looking uh, when I talk to a competitor, it's just me doing my job, being aware. And that's, I always say, great, thank you for letting me know. I appreciate that context behind your answer. And that's really helpful. Now, the other reason I say it's not what you think always is because let's look at the other end of the spectrum. Suppose they say a one, meaning, they immediately ignore the message or delete it from your competitor. All right, great. Now, thanks for letting me know. So I just want to make sure I understand, why did you say one? Why are one or two or three? And they might say this, which happens very frequently. Well, you know, as I mentioned in our, elsewhere in our conversation previously, you know, there's always challenges in, with the product and, you know, the support level or the technology or the, the, ex, the customer experience. And we, we can talk about those more. Every product has challenges. It's never going to be perfect. But for us, we don't, it's not the right time for us to be looking around. You know, for starters, next quarter, we're transitioning to a new ERP system. Uh, that's going to suck up a lot of time and energy. Um, so I just wouldn't be interested in talking to any competitors really or have time. So interestingly, when they say one out of 10, it doesn't mean things are all rosy with you. And when they say 10 out of 10, it doesn't mean they're immediately leaving. So I hope this is, this, this is, again, my lead off question, because I think it really exemplifies the disruptive nature. And also the fact that uh, one thing I hear a lot is, oh, no one's ever asked me that before. And I think that's what you want, is you want to be asking your customers questions that other people aren't asking them, because it positions you as authentic and curious and someone you can trust. So time to back up a little bit. What is radically, what are the components of radically authentic discovery? Um, think about it as, first of all, to define it, it's really a, a new conversation. It's a new type of conversation that you have with customers or prospects or former customers. It works in, in uh, win-loss and churn, churn conversations as well. It's a new way of engaging customers, prospects, former customers. It's not a sales call. It's not a support call. It's not a QBR or an onboarding call. It's a new way of engaging customers and prospects with only one purpose. And that is get them to open up about what's important to them, not your product, but about them. What's, again, getting them to open up about what's important to them. That's the only purpose of it. So the first element uh, is we have to ask better questions, people. We have to ask questions that, as I said, they're disruptive. They use real words, like real life words, like competition. 
um, that our customers and prospects haven't heard before. No more cliches. Um, if I if I ever hear people saying, "Oh, what keeps you up at night?" I will. I, it's sort of like the whatever hair I have left on the back of my head neck stands up, and that's not helping because that they've been asked that question so many times that they give a cliche answer. They don't even think before they answer. So the question should be open ended, but they should also include a little bit of a hook or a spark to make the other person think. And the competition question is a good example. That's a hook. It's, it's something that grabs them. So a lot of the responses I get, and the best responses start with this. Someone will say, uh, I'll ask the competitor question, and we'll say, hmm. So already, things that make you go, hmm, that's good, because they're, they're thinking. They're, they're being thoughtful. They're not just checking the box for you. And, or they might say, uh, that's a great question. And I, I actually always say thank you, because that's how I make my living. And the thing that they say that's most interesting is no one's ever asked me that before. Again, when they say that, that means you're, you're, you're in fresh territory. You know? You're going to be exploring an area that other people haven't maybe heard before outside of the of customer's walls. So I also sometimes hear these, um, these questions described by customer success teams or, or account management or sales folks as bold or courageous. Um, and it's true. Some of them require you to have a little bit of, um, I guess the word gumption comes to mind. You have to kind of, you know, when you ask that competitor question, it takes your breath away a little bit to think about asking a real customer that question at first, because it feels like you're going somewhere where you haven't gone before. Well, guess what? Isn't that the point? If you go somewhere where you haven't gone before, outside of your comfort zone, it's much more likely the customer will open up and go somewhere they haven't gone before. So now, the next element or rule of radical, radically authentic discovery, keep it all about them. I want you to think about it this way. Are they experts in your product? No. No one has, uh, when they're in elementary school, what do you want to be when you grow up? I want to be a software user. No one, no one, is, no one wants to be an expert in the product uh, on, in the customer community. What are they experts in? They're experts in their companies and their teams, problems, priorities, and perceptions. Now, if I was a real marketer, I'd call those the three Ps, but I'm not going to do that. Problems, priorities, and perceptions. That's why you have to ask about those. Ask about them. And when I say business priorities and, and challenges, I mean at the highest level of their company, find out what's going on that's driving, that's the upstream drivers that explain why they need things from you and your, from your product. That is absolutely where some of the best insights are. And I promise you they'll open up uh, like never before. In fact, you will see that when the discovery calls wrap up after let's say 30 minutes and I, I say, uh, you know, I wanna be respectful of your time. A lot of times they say, no problem. I can go a few minutes over, this is important. And that also shows that it's not annoying to them. They're enjoying it. And I think it's, it's not, it ends up not being a chore. And I fear that too many times when we ask customers for their time, uh, it feels like uh, a bit of a chore uh, because they know they're gonna get asked about the product. Next, this one's simple, mute yourself, right? Being on mute, and I mean that literally, is a guardrail. It keeps you from jumping in to solve or sell based on what the customer is saying. These calls, and these questions are not designed to generate things that you need to uh, react to. In fact, you need to not react, uh, which is why you should be on mute. In the moment, you should not be solving or selling because it simply serves to interrupt what the customer wants to talk about. And we've already established, we want, they, we want them talking about themselves, what's important to them. That's the point of radically authentic discovery. It's go where the customer wants to go. Uh, and you're, you're there to learn, not to solve or sell. And we'll talk about a little bit more about that later. Now, I mentioned that one of the other key pillars of radically authentic discovery is asking about their business challenges uh, as part of keep it about them. So uh, not your product. So as Christy would say, LFG, you guys know what that means. Let's go. So here's another question. Let me ask you what, and by the way, that's, exactly how I ask the questions. It's just a very sort of conversational, curious approach, which 
It's just uh, something that I do. You don't have to do it that way. I think it's something that I, you know, I do that has turned, it's kind of a homey down home type thing. So let me ask you, what do you think is the top priority or challenge your board is focused on right now? So in other words, the highest levels of your company, what's the top priority, the top challenge that, that eventually everyone's going to need to be focused on for the next, you know, 12, 18 months, 24 months. So in the customer discovery conversations that I have, uh, this is one of the first questions I ask. It's, it's a stage setter. In other words, this question not only gets you insights, but you're signaling with this question authenticity and you're creating trust because you're not jumping in and asking about features and benefits right off the bat. You're gaining their trust. And we're asking about their business, which gives them a chance to talk more broadly about their company. And as I said before, they seem to want to talk on and on about what's going on in their world. And all of that is great stuff for us to mine and get into. And I want you to note a couple things about the structure of the question. I very intentionally ask for their top priority. I don't say, what are your top, what do you think are the top priorities or what are the top three or something? Why? Because by using a specific prompt or a trigger like top priority, you get more insight because what I've learned over the years is asking for one thing helps them focus and prioritize versus having to think about, okay, now I have to rank order the three things he asked me about, you know, the list. And that ends up diluting their thought process. Um, then once they answer, you can say, uh, all right, great. Why, why is that a priority? What, what are the challenges maybe in the marketplace or internally, or maybe competition that, that are driving that priority or that challenge? Uh, what are the goals that the company has put out that those priorities align with? And, you know, I guess what this adds up to is it's, it's amazing to me. We, we are so focused on the day to day in our jobs. And I've been guilty of it too, that we, we forget that there's a lot of insight to be gained by stepping back and understanding the customer's context, their why, if you will. That board of directors question worked so well that I inspired me to add another question to go even deeper. Uh, so let me let me ask you who who are your who do you define as your customers, and depending on their answer, I'll say and what what do you think their board is focused on right now? Now, why do we ask this question? Because uh, here's why: because I think a lot of times we assume we know who our customers' customers are. Oh, they're an accounting firm, so they sell to CFOs or controllers. Oh, they sell ERP software, so they they must their their customers CIOs. But that what's interesting is this, number one, a lot of times when I ask this question, they define an internal constituency to be their customer. So if you happen to be in marketing, you might say, um, oh, I assume, I assume their customer is, you know, whoever their target audience is. Um, but they also might say, no, our customer is sales um, because we, we, have, we have a demand gen quota, we, our job is generating demand and we have a quota of the number of whatever marketing qualified leads, however they want to define it. And then the second part of the question, what do you think your customers are focused on at the board level, gives you an idea of where their industry is headed, their customer's industry, and how your customer might have to adjust or react or how you can help. Um, and you know what's, what's also interesting is it gives you an identifier like between the lines of how clued in this particular customer that you're talking to, how, how, how in tune they are with their customer's priorities. So you can't fact check them on the call, but you have a sense of whether they're, uh, how quickly the answer, how specific the answer is that they've, they know the answer. Here's another good question. Um, very disruptive. It gets customers and prospects to really open up about what's most important to them. Then that's what we're trying to do. What's most important to them. But it's a heck of a lot more interesting than asking them, so let me ask you, what's really important to you? I mean, that's just, that's a fail. Um, you should be fired if you ask that question, just like the keep me up at night question. So uh, let me ask you, um, and again, that's my conversational tone. I bet your job description is at least a page long or two pages, single spaced. But in there, there's usually one thing that your company is absolutely counting on you to get done. Um, one thing in the job description that, you know, ultimately, you know, you're going to be judged on more than anything else. What is that one thing? It's interesting and notable that 
uh, the most common initial answer to this question is, that's a great question. <laughs> uh, I think the clip I'm about to, to play for you, I think she does that, she says that. Uh, I don't remember if I said thank you or not, but that's how I felt. Um, and you know you're on track when people say that's a good question because it's not a cliche and you're, you're, you can almost feel them thinking. And um, it's almost a, a, it's almost reflects on your, your personal brand and your company's brand to ask a courageous question because it says that you want the truth and that you're authentic. Um, and best of all, of course, it, when you ask this question, the substantive reason to ask it is you're going to understand what's really top of mind for them. And it's, I guarantee it's not going to be about your product. It's going to be about something that's behind their firewall, if you will, that we're going to now have insight into. And that's what we want. We want insights into their world, not our product, at least not at the beginning of the discovery conversation. Because remember, they're experts in what? In their own problems, priorities, and perceptions, not your product. So that's what we should ask. And I guarantee they'll open up. So this next one is very near and dear to my heart, this clip that I'm going to play you. What's the hardest part of your job? So this person is the vice principal of a public high school in an urban area, very diverse urban area in a town in New Jersey. He is the user of my client's software, which is a platform that helps uh, administrators administrate in schools, public schools primarily, but also private schools. Again, as you're listening, I want you to pick up any information you can, what did you hear? So the substance, what did you infer between the lines? What did you observe? And then afterwards, I just wanna make a few points. Here you go. What's the hardest part of your job or the biggest challenge that you face on a regular basis? Yeah, you know, I put a lot of thought into this actually because, you know, interacting with students that aren't motivated with education is really difficult and something you're dealing with, you know, pretty much every day. It's difficult for me to make them see what the future will be uh, without education. So it's, it's really hard to change their mind. They give up sometimes because they don't see education taking them where they need to go. They, you know, for example, have part-time jobs and they think it's pretty good money, but they can't really see beyond that. There's no foresight. And I try to tell them that the goal should be having a good paying full-time job. But again, it's, it's pretty frustrating, hard to get them to see that value. So from a clinical customer discovery standpoint, I want to point out something incredibly important. What did I ask? What's the hardest part of your job? He knows I'm representing this software company that does a student information system. He could have focused his answer very narrowly on the software features, usability, training. That, that's the hardest part. Oh, he's asking me the hardest part of my job. He must mean about the software. But because I didn't ask the question about the product and because he and I had already had the broader conversation leading up to this question, he gave me the most impactful, hardest part of his job in his whole world. And I think it's really important because that's, again, that's where we wanna go. We don't have to get into therapy sessions with these people. We just wanna understand what their world looks like, what's important to them. Now you might say, who cares? Well. I would challenge that and say that you should care. So if I'm a software company and this is one of my users or customers, what I should be hearing from this clip is what? He is so committed to his mission. Like it sounds like a very difficult job and there's, there's all kinds of reasons he could just give up and find another job. He cares so much about the students and probably the parents as well. And he's very focused. So when you empathize with that, you realize, man, this guy's on a mission. So my software better not be doing anything to get in his way. Uh, the product has to help him be more efficient and more effective. I don't want to have, I don't want him having to hunt around for user videos or best practices. I don't want the UI to be wasting his time. Think about that. Think about that. Doesn't empathizing with a major customer priority, not a, not, not, on, not, not features and benefits, but the kind of customer priority that means something in the world. That's very important. And I guarantee you, if you played a clip like this to at a company-wide meeting, the software company in particular, it would have a huge impact because it would say, look how important our role is. We have an opportunity to make such a big impact. So that's why that's one of my favorite clips. So I'm gonna go, I'm gonna start landing the plane here um, because I looks like there's some, a lot of Q&A going on. 
some Q&A going on. So to bring us home, this is uh, absolutely one of the go-to questions. Uh, I use it at the end of every discovery call, and it's definitely one of the most thought-provoking ones. What would make you a customer for life? Now, sometimes it, there's silence, and we have to be comfortable with that silence and not jump in and say, like, here's an example of what I mean. But sometimes if, if they pause long enough, I'll say, well, I don't mean literally, but just, I'm not asking you to sign a hundred year contract, but figuratively speaking, is there anything that would just make you so, uh, feel like, you know, so excited about this vendor relationship or, or that some, some value add or something? Have you ever thought about that? And on this one, this is definitely one of the ones where they say, that's a great question. And again, that's a signal that they're gonna give you a thoughtful answer not an off the cuff answer to a cliche question. And you know what else they say? And this just blows my mind. And I don't, I don't know if it's gonna blow your mind. They say, hmm, no one's ever asked me that before. This is fascinating. So if I asked, if I were able to ask for a show of hands, and I, I do in, in many settings, almost everyone says, yeah, I'd like to have customers for life. I mean, that's what we're asking, right? The right kind of customers. So that's what we want, but customers aren't being asked the question of what the ideal relationship would look like to them from their side of the table. What value do they, would they appreciate or need that they don't get today? Where's their business heading? How can you support them? These are incredibly valuable insights that are there for the asking. Your competitors aren't gonna get these insights because they're not asking these questions because they're not on this webinar. So good for you. It's fantastic. So uh, I wanna give you a heads up. For those of you who like to take screenshots, just a little heads up, I'm about to show you a, one slide with all, not, <clears throat> excuse me, so I probably have 50 radically authentic discovery questions, uh, but these are some of the top questions that I think you will appreciate on one slide. So I'm gonna click and feel free to take a screenshot or take a picture of it, <laughs> whatever you do. Uh, and of course, I'm sort of kidding because you're gonna get all this lovely content after, uh, after the call. Uh, and courtesy of Christie and, and client success. But what I do want to point out one thing here, these three uh, tiers, if you will, on the right. So you notice that there's a triangle, which means we're telescoping from the big picture down to very narrow questions. Um, this on the right indicates the flow of the conversations. If I'm doing a full customer discovery conversation, in other words, you can pick and choose a couple of these questions and use them in a QBR. You can use them in a a sales call, you can use them in an onboarding call. You can decide where to use them, uh, onesie twosie, you know, they're modular. But if you're doing an entire customer discovery call, you start with asking about their business, as I've said. Then you ask some questions about them, their world, their immediate world of scope of responsibility. And then you can then, and only then, once you've shown that you're interested in the big picture stuff and them, then you can ask questions about hey, what do you think about us? So for example, uh, what's one thing that surprised you since you signed the contract? Um, uh, if your boss knew you were talking to me, what would you want, what, what would they want you to tell me or ask me? Again, these are just different ways to get people to open up about what's important to them. So I'm looking at my watch where it's 1.44 my time, Eastern time. I wanna blow through uh, some techniques uh, I'll give you the screenshot alert, actually, because I'm going to skip over the individual ones and just give you the whole thing at once. I'm going to highlight a few of these techniques. Number one, start these discovery conversations with a quiet mind. We all know how many different directions were pulled in at the same time. So I, I, this was something I've learned sometimes the hard way. You know, I'm trying to send an email. Uh, I have two boys, uh, well, I guess young men. Uh, one of them called. I had him on speaker while I was typing the email. And I wasn't really paying attention and I, I, I was, but I wasn't. And he said, uh, I just, he's at school away at college. And I, he said, uh, hey, um, I just wanna ask you real quick. If someone asks you to sign something, is it good to have a lawyer look at it first? <laughs> I went, okay, let me just stop with the email. I hear you and you need some advice. And so of course that was a hilarious story that we'll tell our grandchildren about. Um, breathe and smile. Definitely a lot of research out there that says people can feel when you smile on the phone with them. Uh, don't solve. I know this is a hard one. I know this is a hard one. You know, if you, especially if you're in customer success, account management, and, and sales too. 
you know, you're, you're in this role because you like people, you want to solve problems, you want to make their lives and jobs better. But all, all it does when you're trying to solve Sorry, something, I hear oh, thank you, Siri, for interrupting me. Um, all it does when you solve in the middle of a call is you're taking away from their flow, from the customer's flow. Now, that doesn't mean you can't solve the problem. My recommendation is always take a note, jot it down. At the end of the call, you say, look, I, obviously there's an issue in this area that you brought up. Let me make sure I heard you correctly, X, Y, Z. Um, can we talk about it a little bit more? Do you have time? I'd like to understand some context or can we get on a call with our subject matter expert? And so um, that, it's an easy way to handle it so that you do solve it or get on a path to solving it without interrupting their flow. And I think number 10, embracing the silence is a big one. I'm not talking about this weird, uncomfortable, long silence. I'm just saying, let them think. Let them think about their answer. Let them think about, um, let them formulate their answer. If they, if they pause, let them pause. It's okay. Um, you, you know that you always have the option to say, you know, is the question unclear or did you understand the question? But don't be afraid of that kind of silence. So to wrap it up here, uh, radically authentic discovery, uh, asking disruptive questions, keep it all about them and then just mute yourself. And, and I, I literally, um, you know, put some stickies up that says mute yourself. And then if they have, if something comes up that you want to follow up at the end of the call, just jot down some questions. Anytime you feel like saying something other than the questions or probing on their questions with how, why, what, like, let me, you know, help me understand, just write it down, write it down. And um, I want to, I'm going to um, go to the last slide here and, and we'll talk about questions. I think we're going to go off off of uh, uh, sharing the slides. Um, Christy, I'm gonna turn it over to you, but I do wanna let you know, if you want more information and, and a cheat sheet that has all this stuff in it, just you can use this QR code if you like to take pictures or go to this web address, strategiccustomerconvos.com. And if you do, you'll see a pop-up where you can get the radically authentic discovery cheat sheet. So, Thank you so much for your time and attention. Christy, I'm going to turn it back over to you and you tell me what I missed on the chat. Well, first of all, Bob, I mean, I already had your deck and I found myself screenshotting. So <laughs> I just have to say, I think that the content was awesome. Um, I think you asked a lot of questions I haven't even thought about. So for me, like I said, I, I struggled with in LinkedIn earlier. I said, oh my gosh, how am I going to moderate and take notes? And, and I managed to do it. I've got pages and pages of, of little tidbits of things here, Bob. So thank Good. you Good. so much. I'm, I'm sure everyone found this really, really insightful. So I'm going to open up a couple questions. So I will just encourage everybody. I know there was a couple things in chat, which I believe we captured. Um, but I will ask you guys, continue to drop questions into the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom screen. So if you hover over, it should be next to a, like a raise hand icon, you'll see Q&A. Just head over there and drop questions in. So first question here, Bob, um, there was a question around the, the frequency, right? So how often are you leading these types of discovery calls with your customers? So these would be with my client's customers. So um, yeah, no, it, it, so there, there's no prescribed frequency. Um, I think that there are two ways to do this. One is, as I alluded to, take a few of the questions out and bake them into your regular process. Um, the other way to do it, and this is, this is again how I make my living, is sort of uh, doing a listening tour of my client's customers. So it's an initiative that has an outcome in mind or an objective, which is we need to fix, this is my world, we need to fix our positioning and messaging and value proposition in the market. We're just way off base. Our customers have changed. We need someone to go out and really understand what's going on and tell us what's going on and then make recommendations. I, I think that not enough companies do that. So, But that's a pretty intense, it's not spreading uh, the, the activity over multiple people in the company. It's usually one or two people uh, who are having those calls so they can aggregate what they heard and make recommendations or, again, work with someone outside the company to do it. But there, there's, no real, um, there's no real cadence to it. I think you should just, the goal is to get to know your customers much better as well as you possibly can uh, about them. However many calls it takes to do that, um, you just need to do it. 
Bob, I have a quick follow up on that. So obviously you're helping companies by going out and connecting with their customers to uncover a lot of this. Do you, do you think that we can do it ourselves successfully? Do you think it's, we're going to have the same impact? We're going to be able to get the same content from our customers if we're doing it directly as opposed to bringing a third party into the process? Yes, you absolutely can. And, and that's, I mean, that's why, right? That's why we're giving away all this content is so people can understand how to do it themselves. I think the key is you really have to change your mindset from one of let's get feedback on the product to let's ask questions that they've never heard before about them. What's important to them? If you never ask a product question in the entire call, that, that, that's not, that's okay. So as long as you do that and you ask open-ended questions versus leading questions, I mean, I, I do see my share of companies doing it internally that are just full of biases, unconscious and otherwise. So I would just caution you with that. That's a great point, Bob. Um, all right, so we've got another question from Linda Sharp. So earlier you talked about asking the question about understanding the board's challenges. So the yeah. question was, why focus on the board's challenge and not the customer's challenge? So it's so so there are questions about the customer's challenge. So I didn't I didn't really share that, but that that's that's what really what you're saying is by asking about the board is, well, so I just want to make sure we're not being confused. So it was asking about the customer's board of directors, your customer's board, when I played a clip of that. And then the follow-up was, what do you think your, what do you think your customers, meaning your customer's customers boards are wrestling with right now? And so you can, you can, you can skip one or both of those questions and use a different one to get that high level, um, you know, perspective, but yeah, I mean, asking about your customers' challenges is what this whole thing is about. You just can't ask it. What are your challenges? Like, people fall asleep. That's why they don't accept our invitations to, um, you know, meetings. Sometimes I see so much traffic on community sites. But how do we get our customers to engage? They won't engage. They won't, you know, respond. You have first of all, there's two things. They're they have a perception of how the call is going to be, and so we can correct that perception. The other is, and I didn't have time to show it today. Um, it's how you position the request. If it's positioned as, um, you know, hi, you know, lots of exclamation points. We're really excited to talk to you soon and we really want your feedback. You have to disrupt that too and say, we're doing some work on how we approach the market for our long-term success. You're an expert in what you do. We want to understand that. Do you have 30 minutes? Make it easy, you know? And my, my email template that I use that my clients send out to, rent, to schedule calls for me it, it's got a, um, it's like an 85% open rate and a 65% acceptance rate. 65% of the people who get that email schedule a call with me. Now, again, that's because it's part of a strategic initiative that my client, you know, the CEO of my client sends it out and says, we hired a, this is so important. We hired a third party independent. He, he wants to, we want to find out some stuff about how you view the industry, where it's headed. Do you have 30 minutes? So that's why the acceptance rate is so high. I hope that helps. I think it's awesome, Bob. And in fact, I think you answered Teresa Schmidt's question also, who asked, do you expose to the customer why you want to talk to them? And what do you say to convince them and to give them their time? So I think you hit on that. But is there anything else you want to add? Uh, yes. You don't really tell them anything other than that. In other words, sometimes my client will say, well, are we going to send the questions in advance? No way. I don't want them picking. I had one person out of 2,400 conversations. Um, it's, it's hard to explain. She was actually an employee of my client and I was doing employee interviews because that's also part of this. Mm -hmm. And she wrote, gave me written answers. And I, I said, well, I still need to talk to you. I, I really would like to have a conversation. Well, I send you everything I know. I don't want that. I don't want prepared stuff. I want people reacting and thinking in real time. So there you go. Well, I think you kind of also answered another question there from Robbie Mitchell, who asked, have you ever used these questions and strategies as part of a discovery internally to understand employees' attitudes and challenges? So, Yes, and, and I want to point out that is such a good question. Thank you, Robbie, because I didn't start out doing that. But as I started to realize, there are tremendous disconnects between what customers think and what employees think. And that's not good. And so in order to identify those disconnects and, and the scope of them and to ultimately form a solution for my clients, it really helps to talk to employees. And for whatever reason, uh, I think that is harder for an internal person to do, right? Asking your peer 
So um, I, I, I think that's a really important point. Thank you. Excellent. So we've got another question here from Laura Dial. How do you follow up when after they've finished talking and you've asked more questions without trying to come up with a solution? You thank them. <laughs> And um, I've had some clients that want to send a $25 Amazon gift card or they'll offer that, especially when it's a churned a former customer or a win-loss call, a loss, I'd say, it should close loss. It helps to kind of get them, you know, leaning into it a little bit. Um, but that's, that's a really good question. And I, gotta, I want to read it again because it's under, I think it moved to answered. Um, yeah, I think, um, so that's a great question in the sense that you're, the way you position the call is that they're not expecting you to solve it on the call and they're, they're under, they understand that this is a bigger picture thing that you're doing. And therefore you're not walking away with a checklist of action items that you have to get done for them. Mm -hmm. So you, when you thank them, you keep it big and real. And I always recommend to my clients, like, let's when we have a readout and when we have an internal recommendation on how we're going to use this information, let's go back and specifically thank the people that participated and tell them, show them the work that we did on positioning or messaging, and they'll appreciate that. So, but it, it's definitely a good question because, you know, I think it's important to, um, to set that expectation up front that this is not a customer satisfaction call where we're going to write down problems and go solve them. I think it's great. Um, okay, I think we've got a, a few more minutes, so hopefully we can get through a few more questions. So Chelsea Alterman asked, if your company doesn't have regular QBRs or I guess a forum for this type of conversation and only communicates with clients over email, how could you initiate this radically authentic discovery process with your company and introduce this to clients? Is this process only possible to take over phone or Zoom or is there an email version or some, I guess, digitally exchanged version of this same conversation no <laughs> um as jay nathan and i talk about sometimes not everything can scale i'm sorry um it would be nice to use email look i mean i'm i'm very dismissive about using email for this the reality is you might be able to ask a few questions in an email but you know they're very open-ended questions and it would be i think difficult to recreate the atmosphere that you have on a call. So I'm gonna rule out email. Um, but then this question about if you don't have regular QBR, like sort of the um, tech touch, you know, mostly in touch over email. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. Like people, just because they're maybe a smaller customer and they don't have, they don't get QBR, whatever the reason is, they're still human, they'll still talk to you. And I think that's a mistake people make with when they have a, like a self-service product or something, it's like surveys. Just, it's all about surveys. Well, guess what? Surveys do not, I always joke that the survey is the thing that you're filling out while your friends are going to Chipotle and you're like, wait for me, I just have to finish this survey. And you're like, boom, 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 boom. So I, you have to just bear in mind that surveys have um, an important role, but they cannot give you the depth and definition that these conversations can. All right, uh, I think we're a minute away. So I think I'm gonna pause on any additional questions there, but, I'll, but I might send you some additional questions your way. Um, and if you wanna answer them on LinkedIn or correspond yeah. with the community, I think that would be great. Um, so I do just wanna stop and we're gonna stop now because we are at the top of the hour, but I wanna, Bob, I wanna thank you so much for your time. Um, your content was phenomenal. I know that I personally learned a ton. I'm sure the community did as well. So I just wanna express our sincere gratitude from me and everyone at Client Success for you participating in today's webinar our series. So thank you very much. I enjoyed it. And you are a natural moderator. So just, you know, be careful what you, <laughs> what you're good at. You might end up doing it again. You did a great well, job. Uh, you made it easy on me, Bob. Uh, content was great. The community is so engaged. I'd love to see what's going on here in the chat. We're going to take the conversation over to LinkedIn. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go put a post out there following up. I'm going to highlight one of your questions, probably my favorite. And I won't tell you which one it is. And we'll see if we can get the community over back to LinkedIn get some more Q&A answered here, Bob. But I really, again, just want to thank you so much for your time. I want to thank everyone for taking their time today to join us. Hopefully you all found it very engaging. As I mentioned earlier, we will be sending out the recorded video as well as Bob's deck with all of his questions. So if you didn't screenshot it, it's okay. You'll have all of those wonderful tidbits there. Um, but again, thank you all very much. And we're going to continue this conversation on LinkedIn.
Thanks, everybody.